There's such power in God's presence. He is almighty, and yet that's balanced by His overwhelming love for us. In fact, He loved the world so much that from the very beginning, He made a plan for our redemption. And He created every place and everything that would make that redemption happen. Upon an initial thought, Calvary might seem to be a lasting place of sadness, grief, and pain. However, instead of it being a place of a great tragedy, it became a place where we can discover how deeply God loves us and what He was willing to sacrifice to show it. All any of us has to do is respond to His love and accept Him with trust and gratitude.
Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? Does it mean he no longer loves us if trouble or calamity or persecution or hungry, cold, danger, or even threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, the overwhelming victory is ours through Jesus Christ. Whether we're high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give you back the life I owe, that in your ocean depths its flow. May richer and fuller be. And I thank you, O love, that will not let me go. From a grateful heart, I thank you for the mercy that you show. You are worthy of my praise, for you hold Today we celebrate Calvary's love. Jesus Christ's victory over darkness and victory over the grave. Because He is alive, we have hope. We must never forget the most amazing and profound words from the angel that day. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen.
That's good. You can give them a hand. That's a good job. Uh, got this on, D? I tell you, we're going we're gonna to let Brett, Brother Brett go because we're going to dismiss the children and let them go to Children's Church. And I think we're going to switch up a little bit here. Brother Bob, we'll let you, we're going to let the children go. We're going to sing one stanza of 149, Because He Lives, all right? One stanza, and we're going to let the choir come down and find a seat there with you. And uh, we'll kind of make that transition. You sat for a few minutes. Why don't you stand together? When we hit the first stanza, children, you can leave and uh, go to Children's Church as we sing 149, Because He Lives. Brother Bob. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. singing be seated if you will take your bible this morning if you would and look at matthew chapter 28 matthew 28 with me this morning familiar passage to us that deals with the resurrection of christ The Bible says, Matthew 28, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture today, and Lord, as we now look into your word and we desire to receive the truth you have for us today, I pray, God, that as we focus on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you would help us to understand what that means to us, how important it is that we have a living Savior, and that Christ conquered the grave, and he conquered death, he conquered sin. And so, Lord, Help each of us to give us your, give our attention to you as we listen carefully to your word this morning. Minister to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. If we see Jesus merely dying on the cross and being buried in the tomb, then there's no hope of forgiveness for you and me. There's no hope of having our sins forgiven. The resurrection is what gives us assurance that Jesus has overcome the penalty of sin, which is death, and great victory over the grave. The truth is kind of illustrated in an incident, which I understand is pretty well known in England. It was after the, the Battle of Waterloo in June of 1815. All of England was waiting for the news about the outcome of the campaign. The Duke of Wellington had opposed Napoleon Bonaparte in this battle. Of course, this is long before the telegraph, the telephone, the television, or text messages, or anything else. So watchers would be stationed along the coast to read the flag signals from the returning sailing vessels. It was a cloudy, foggy morning, but finally one watcher 
spied a sailing vessel beginning to signal a message. And what they read and what they could see was this, Wellington defeated. And the fog closed in and that's all they saw. And that message was relayed all across England and the nation was gripped with discouragement and defeat. Hours later, however, the fog had lifted and they were able to see the entire message as it came through. Wellington defeated the enemy. And that changed everything all across England. Discouragement was banished and the nation rejoiced in the good news. And I think that illustrates very perfectly what took place at Calvary. As, as the viewers watched Jesus die on the cross and as Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea came and took His body and prepared it to go into Joseph's tomb and they, they, they put His body in the tomb, I think most of them thought, Jesus is defeated. Or the headline might have been, Jesus defeated. Oh, but it wasn't over yet. And when Sunday came and He arose from the dead, the headline would be, Jesus defeated the enemy. He defeated the enemy. You understand where these disciples were. They heard Jesus say He'd come to seek and to save that which was lost. They heard Jesus say that He'd come that people might have life and might have it more abundantly. He said, whosoever's thirsty could come to Him and He'd give them water to drink that they'd never thirst again. He said that whoever followed Him would never walk in darkness, but would have the light of life. He said He's come to give, I give unto you eternal life. But then He was crucified. In their eyes, and, and, and in reality, He was dead. And I'm sure they relived that day, though they were not at the cross. I, I can't help but believe they were watching. They saw the events of that day. They remembered how the sun suddenly disappeared and everything became dark from noon to 3 p.m. They remember the earthquake that took place. The events that caused that Roman soldier at the foot of Jesus' cross to look up and say, truly, this was the Son of God. The message rang out in their mind and maybe throughout Jerusalem, Jesus has been defeated. Jesus has been defeated. I think the disciples spent three days and three nights pretty discouraged, pretty downcast. But you understand, as the women made their way to the grave, as we read in Matthew 28 early on that Sunday morning, they, they were discussing about the, the stone over the mouth of that grave and how they were going to move it. But when they got close enough, they realized they don't have to move it. The angels have already moved it. And, and they, 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 they don't go into the, the, the tomb, but they look in. And, and they see that He's not there. And of course the angel says, Hey, uh, don't seek the living among the dead. He's not here. He's risen. Now go back and tell the disciples that He's risen from the dead. And the, the word spreads that Jesus has not been defeated. Jesus has defeated the enemy. And He's given us victory over death and victory over Satan. Now what does that mean for us? You say, man, I'm glad that resurrection, and I know everybody focuses on that, and that's what you hear about, and, 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 and we, we like to know what does that mean for me? And I'm just going to give you three very simple things that it means for you and me. Why it's important. Number one, it means that our sins are forgiven. We can have our sins forgiven. You understand, the Bible says all of us are sinners. I do not know everybody in the room, but I know something about everybody in the room. And that is this, I know that you're a sinner. And I know not only are we all sinners, but I know something else about you. You're dying. You say, oh, Pastor, you know something that you, 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 you and my doctor know something I don't know? No, uh, we're all dying. In fact, from the moment we're born, we begin to die. And, and death is sentence. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Death begins to work in us. It's the paycheck. It's what we get for our sin against God. We don't sin, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. 
Everybody is a sinner. And because of what you are, that's why we do what we do. And God says the end result of that sin against Him will be death. Death is separation from God. It is appointed unto man once to die. And so I know that we all want to push it out as far as we can and we want to get it as far away as we possible and we hope God will give us 70 years or 80 years or 90 years and we hope we can push it out there. But I know that eventually we'll get sick or we'll get diseased and we will die. Every single person in this room will face death. But the Bible says that God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now wait a minute. Jesus was the Son of God. Being the Son of God, the Bible says He never committed one sin. Jesus Christ was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. And yet He never sinned. Never spoke a word He shouldn't have said. Never, never had a thought He should not have had. Never went somewhere that He should not have gone. Tempted in every way that we're tempted, yet He never sinned. If He never sinned, He would not have to pay the wages of sin, which is death. But He went to the cross, and He hung there, and He bled, and He died. He paid the wages of sin. But the Bible makes it clear, He died for us. He died in our place. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that He, God, hath made Him, Jesus, sin for us. When He, Jesus, knew no sin. Why? That we might have the righteousness of God in Him. That that perfectness, that perfect life that Jesus lived, when He went to the cross, God placed our sins, every sin you've ever committed, sins you haven't committed yet, but He knows you will, all of your sin, past, present, future. Let me ask you a question. When Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, how many sins had you committed? None. You weren't around. All of your sins were future sins. And they were all placed on Jesus. And when you, by faith, place your trust in Jesus Christ, God takes His righteousness, His perfectness, and He places that on our account. That's what it means to be in Christ. God looks at me, He looks at you when you put your faith in Jesus and you're as righteous as Jesus is. Now, when Christ died for our sins, He's the Lamb of God that is sacrificed for our sin. Does God accept that payment? How do we know God accepts the payment? Because three days later, God raises Him from the dead. And God is saying, I'm accepting the payment of Jesus Christ for the sin of mankind. And He raises them from the dead. And He receives the payment that Jesus made for our sins. The resurrection is God's vindication of Jesus' work on the cross. And when that happens, the Bible says if we confess our sin, that God is faithful and just. He's right to forgive us of all our sin. How can it be just for God to forgive our sins? Because Jesus paid for them when He died on the cross. And because He was buried and God raised Him from the dead, God said, I'm accepting that payment for man's sin. Now I can forgive everybody's sin who asks me for forgiveness and comes to me for forgiveness. That's why the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Listen, the reason there's not salvation any other is no one else paid for your sin. You can't have any other religion. You believe any other religion you want, but you still got your sin problem to deal with. Your sins aren't forgiven. And your sins are only forgiven by Jesus Christ and His payment for you on the cross. I've never been to where Muhammad is buried. But if I went there, I would find a grave that had his name on it. I've not been to Israel, or what's referred to as the Holy Land. Some people think that's Ohio. 
But I'm sure there are graves there for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and anywhere you go, those bodies will be in the grave. But you can go to the tomb where Jesus Christ was placed, and you find it empty. And because it's empty, we can have forgiveness of sin. You see, that means Jesus is alive. And, and, and that's going to bring us to the second reason why the resurrection is important to us. He's alive, and the Bible says because He's alive, listen, He ever lives, Hebrews chapter 4, to make intercession for us. He's at the right hand of God to intercede for you and me, to help you and me. The second thing I want to leave with you this morning is the reason it's important to us, or what does resurrection mean to us? It means that it allows Christ to live through us. It allows Christ to live through us. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 says, For I am crucified with Christ. It means I, me. What I want, what I think, what I feel, my way, my thoughts, my feelings. I died with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Well, how do I live? It says, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God. You see, when you receive Christ as your Savior, He comes in our, to dwell in our hearts by faith, Colossians tells us. And Christ desires to continue to live through you and me. It's not a matter of you trying harder to live the Christian life. You'll be frustrated. You're trying to do it by yourself. And, and it'll never, ever work. You'll be very frustrated. You'll be very disappointed. He is, he is there to empower us, to give us the ability we need to let. Hey, listen, He defeated sin. He defeated the power of sin. He defeated everything, every temptation that you and I would ever face. We don't have to face it. We let Jesus face it. That's where the victory comes. Pastor David Coffin tells of a Friday right before Easter when he said his house looked like more like a set for the rescue 911 than it did for a, a preparation place for Easter Sunday. Barbara, his wife of 15 years, had just gotten home at 3 a.m. after a long shift as a hospital nurse. Her heart started to beat more than 100 beats a minute. Her pulse raced so fast they couldn't even measure it. They tried massage and relaxation exercises, but nothing helped. So finally, in desperation, they called 911. And in the darkness of the early morning hours, the emergency medical team arrived and rushed his normally healthy 43-year-old wife to the hospital. In those early morning hours, when the pastor coffin was deep in his own darkness, he began to weep as he thought about the unthinkable. Now, doctors were able to control her atrial fibrillation, but she was admitted to the intensive care cardiac unit at the hospital. She did have another episode on Saturday, and the doctor again was able to bring it under control. But as the pastor went home to his empty house that night, facing an Easter Sunday morning that he couldn't cancel, but didn't have a whole lot of heart for, he prayed. He wept. He pleaded for Jesus to give him the strength to be a good husband and a good pastor. And he thought to himself, how do I get up tomorrow and celebrate the resurrection when I'm living in the crucifixion? He prayed some more and paced the room. And about 11.30 at night, a pastor friend called him from out of state. He was asking him, what did he plan to preach on tomorrow morning? Well, he never got to that. He just poured his heart out to his friend about what he was feeling and what he was thinking. He said, my friend gave me a couple thoughts to hang on to. He said, first, Christ is the Savior and rose from the grave. He said, Dave, you are not Christ. Jesus will give you the power to lead the congregation to worship Him tomorrow. Secondly, 
Barb knows that you love her. And she would want you to be the best pastor you can be tomorrow morning. He said he got only about three hours of sleep that night. But he indeed found out that as he got up the next morning and delivered the message to his church, that Christ indeed does strengthen you. Christ indeed does give you power. And he proclaimed the Easter message that he is risen with clarity and with power and with great joy. His wife Barbara soon recovered as well. But they both discovered the power that Jesus gives you for daily living. Don't think that salvation is just a matter of, I got my ticket, I don't burn in hell. No, no, no. There's so much more than that that Christ has for you. He is, he is a living Savior. It's not something, hey, my salvation, yeah, Jesus died on the cross, I trust my Savior, I got my ticket, I'm good. No, 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 no. He lives in you. He's alive. He's alive. He lives, the songwriter said, He lives within my heart. He does, if you know Christ as your Savior. And allow Him to not just live in you, allow Him to live through you. Live by His strength and live by His power. Let me read you what Mark Twain wrote. Mark, Mark Twain said this. A myriad of men are born. They labor and sweat and struggle. They squabble and scold and fight. They scramble for little mean advantages over each other. Age creeps upon them. Infirmities follow. Those they love are taken from them. And the joy of life is turned to aching grief. It, the release, comes at last. The only unpoisoned gift earth has ever had for them. And they vanish from a world where they were of no consequence. A world which will lament them for a day and then forget them forever. Boy, isn't that encouraging? Huh? That's, hey, that's life without Jesus Christ. That's it. No victory over problems. No victory over life struggles. No victory over sins of this life. Jesus' resurrection guarantees us that we have the power to overcome the power of sin. You don't have to succumb to sin if you rely on the power of Christ. We can say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He lived victorious over the power of sin and over the circumstances of his life. But you must yield to him. You must, you must take your hands off the steering wheel and let him have control and, and do what he only he can do for you. So it means that we can have our sins forgiven. It means Christ can live in us and through us. And then thirdly, it means we have hope for a future with Him. We have hope for a future with Him. You know, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, we don't have any hope for the future at all. In fact, Paul said, if it's just this life that we have, we are of all men most miserable. Nothing to look forward to. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Would you turn there please? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul writing to the church at Corinth here. 1 Corinthians 6. Here's, a, here's an amazing promise. Notice what he says in verse 14. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by His own power. He said, hey, God raised up Jesus. You know what that means? He's going to raise you and me as well. That's the, that's the first fruits, if you will. They will always take the, a, a sheaf or a part of whatever they were growing or whatever they had planted. The very first fruit to come up, they'd take it and they'd take it to the temple and they would offer it to God in a very elaborate ceremony. It's called the, the offering of the first fruits. And, and they would all, Israel would all do this, and it's a promise that there's a harvest yet to come. 
And the Bible says Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. What's that mean? It means you and I are going to be raised again too. You and I, it's what Jesus said in John 14. He said, I'm going away and I'm preparing a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. He said, and, I, I, and, and I'm preparing that place for you and listen, I'll come again and I'll receive you unto myself because I want you to be where I am. My friend, that is going to happen. And when that happens, the Bible says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. They're going to rise first. Every time there's a funeral and every time there's a burial and you go to the cemetery and you read 1 Corinthians 15 and you say, hey, this is what we're doing. We're sowing a natural body, but it's going to be raised a spiritual body. We're sowing a corruptible seed, but it's going to be raised an incorruptible seed. We're sowing a mortal body. It's going to be raised an immortal body. We're, we're preaching the resurrection to the people that are there. That's why, that's, I, I was going to say something there, I won't. But just, that's a, that's a message that we preach. Jesus is preparing a place right now for every single believer. Every single one of you who put your faith in Jesus Christ, your Savior, He's preparing a place for you. That's incredible. He's not, listen, He's not preparing it for the unbeliever. He's not preparing a place for the atheist. He's not preparing a place for the Buddhist. He's not preparing a place for the Muslim. He is preparing a place for those who believe in Him. You say, boy, that's narrow. He said, narrow is the way that leads to life. Few there be that find it. Thank God that you had somebody tell you about it. Amen? Those who believe in Christ die, and the Bible says we're absent from the body because the body goes in the ground. That's going to be resurrected when He returns, but the soul, your spirit, is immediately with God. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. We got back from Rockford on Thursday evening. Around 10 o'clock is when we pulled in and had a text message from Kathy Kaufman that Terry was gone. Her husband had gone to be with the Lord about an hour earlier. But don't let, as we discussed that night, don't let anybody say you lost your husband. He's not lost. We know exactly where he is. He's with the Lord Jesus. You see, absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's the promise of Scripture. And He's there. And, and one day, we'll all be there. It'll be a great, great time together. Thank God for heaven. Eric Barker was a missionary who spent many years in Portugal preaching the gospel, oftentimes under adverse conditions. It was during World War II. The situation was becoming very critical, and he was advised to send his wife and eight children back to England for their safety. His sister and her three children were also evacuated on the same ship. Though his family had to leave, he stayed behind to finish the work before he would go join them in England. It was the Sunday after their departure, and Pastor Barker stood up before his congregation. He said, oh, well, I've just received word that my family is all, that they have arrived home safely. He then proceeded with the service as usual, and it wasn't until after the service that morning that they understood the full meaning of Missionary Barker's words. You see, just before the service started that morning, he got a telegram telling him that a submarine had torpedoed the ship that carried his family and everybody on board was killed. But he knew that everyone in his family had trusted Christ as their Savior. In fact, they had arrived safely home. It was their heavenly home. And though he was overcome by grief, he knew that he had a sure hope that he'd see his family again because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Death isn't final. Death isn't final. Death is transition. In fact, 
this, this life is very small. It's almost nothing when you compare it to eternity. You, uh, I've told this story before. I don't have a pencil up here, but uh, I have a pen. It's, it's almost like, do you see the little tip of that pen that you click? That little thing right there? That's, that's this life. You know what the rest of that is? It's all eternity, and of course it goes on forever. Why do I spend all my time worrying about this and neglect all of this? But people do it all the time. Why would I focus on that little bit when I have all eternity? That's, that's really what it's all about is eternity. It's not about life. But what you do for eternity depends on what you do with Jesus Christ in this life. Will you receive him as your Savior? Have you ever personally trusted him to give you the gift of eternal life? That your sins would be forgiven? That you could have a home in heaven one day with him? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Paul Azinger is a professional golfer, and he was diagnosed with cancer when he was 33 years old. He had just won the PGA Championship, and he said, I had a genuine fear come over me that I could die from cancer. But then he said, something else hit me even harder. He said, I thought I'm going to die eventually anyway, whether from cancer or something else. It's just a question of when. And he said, but as I was consumed with those thoughts, everything I'd accomplished in golf meant nothing to me. All I wanted to do was live. He said, then I remembered something that Larry Moody, who teaches a Bible study for the professional golfers on tour, had said to me, he said, Zinger, we're not in the land of the living going to the land of the dying. We're in the land of the dying going to the land of the living. Boy, that's profound. Are you going to the land of the living? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Do you have, do you have that assurance that that when you close your eyes, that if God doesn't wake you up here on earth, that your next breath will be in heaven. <clears throat> Kathy Kaufman shared with me, shared with you a humorous story. I might tell it at a service. She said that was Thursday, and she was leaning down next to him, and she said, I was singing to him in the garden. And she said, I was singing in the garden. I come to the garden alone. And she says, I'm singing to him. And she said, I stopped. And I said, now, Terry, don't you die now. Or Pastor Slayball tell everybody, my singing killed you. <laughs> she sang that song to him. And then she said, and later on that night, and this was a blessing because uh, I call her Mona. I think it's, it's not pronounced quite that way. Um, it was Terry's brother, Bill who had cancer, his wife, she was there with Kathy when Terry went. That, that's just amazing that God orchestrated that, that she would be there that night with her. And they were watching. And, of course, you know, as, as someone gets near crossing over, the breaths get further between. If you've been around a loved one that died, you sometimes there's no breath there for a while, and you look and you think, are they gone? And then you see him take another breath. But her last... His last breath, she leaned down and told him that she loved him. And he drew his last breath and he went to heaven. How? Ever think about his next breath? His next breath? What he was looking at? <laughs> what he got to see? Wow. Oh, we, we sorrow because it's hard to say goodbye to people we love. Hard to say goodbye to people we've spent our life with. But they're not thinking about that. <laughs> With what they're seeing and what they're experiencing, they'd never come back. They wouldn't come back. It doesn't matter what the offer is, they'd never come back. <laughs> Heaven's a wonderful place. Don't miss out on that. Don't miss out on that. Forgiveness of sin is yours. The power to live for Christ, the power to let Christ live through you 
and have victory in your life, you don't have to be in bondage. You don't have to be a slave to sin and a slave to your desires. Let Christ live in you. Let Him live through you. and Let Him take you one day to be with Him. What a blessed promise to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But it's all the risen Savior. If you trusted Him as your Savior, no man comes to the Father but by me. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you, Lord, for a risen Savior. Thank you, Lord, because He's alive, He's able to save all those that come unto God by Him. And Father, I would pray, first of all, that any in the room today who has never asked Christ to be their Savior, they've never trusted Him personally as their Savior, that they might put their faith and trust in Him this morning. Receive forgiveness of sin. Receive the gift of eternal life. And I pray for those believers in the room, those who have accepted Him as their Savior, that they would say, that they would allow Christ to live in them and through them. They would stop trying to do it in their power. Do it in His power. Allow Christ to live through them. And Lord, help us today. Some needed the encouragement that there's a heaven. Their loved ones are there who knew Christ. And one day we'll all be there. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And we can comfort one another with those words. We can encourage each other with those words. And I pray we would. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And I'll finish praying in just a moment. We'll have our invitation. I wonder how many folks here this morning can say, Pastor, there's a time in my life when I did trust Christ as my Savior. I'm, if somebody asked me if I was going to heaven, I'd be able to say I'm going to heaven not because I'm a good person, because of what Jesus has done for me. And my faith is in Christ alone as my Savior. Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. I know that I'm saved this morning. Would you hold it up for a moment that I may see it? I know that I'm saved. Okay, you may put it down. You hear today and would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure. If I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know there's a time in my life when I ever realize what Christ did for me and that I can ask Him to forgive me and to give me the gift of eternal life and that He would save me. Well, Pastor, I appreciate you praying for me. I know God's dealing with my heart. Would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me this morning, Pastor? You couldn't raise it the first time, but you raise it this time. Would you do that? God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I see that. I wonder how many Christians here today would say, Preacher, I know Christ is my Savior. But I need Christ to live through me. I want to I give up the controls. I want Him to be in control. I want to live, live a life yielded to Him. I want victory over sin. I want victory over my circumstances. Just as Christ had the victory, I want Him to give me that victory in my life. But maybe you're here today and say, Preacher, you know what? I just need to hear again that Jesus has a place for me. Heaven is being prepared. And my loved ones are there. And I needed the encouragement today, Preacher. God has spoken to my heart. Would you say, pray for me? Would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me this morning, Pastor? Thank you. Praise the Lord. That's wonderful. You may put them down. In a moment, I'm going to pray and we'll have our invitation. Listen carefully, if you would. If you raised your hand this morning, God has spoken to your heart. Then as soon as the piano begins to play, Bob will sing. You slip from your seat and come to the altar, will you? If you slipped your hand up and said, you know, I don't know for sure that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that I've ever trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. You come. When others are coming to pray, you just slip out and come, will you? We'll have someone take a Bible. And they'll show you from the Bible how you can know Christ and you can receive his gift of eternal life. Don't delay. When the music starts, Bob sings, you slip from your seat and come. Others will be coming to pray and to thank God for what he's doing in their life or to yield themselves to Christ to live through them or to just thank God for a place called heaven and that Jesus is preparing a place for them and that their loved ones are with Christ and how wonderful it must be for them. Whatever it is that the Lord's dealt with your heart about, obey him this morning, will you? Father, bless this invitation. May your will be done in every heart and life now.
thank you for speaking to hearts. And I pray, Lord, that eternal decisions will be made this morning. You'll seal those decisions around an altar today. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, we'll stand to our feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him now this morning. Will you please? Hear the Savior That's right. say, Thy strength indeed is small. That's right. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he was dead white as snow. Father, we thank you now for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you for a risen Savior that we serve today. Thank you, Lord, that we can talk with him and walk with him along this narrow way. And Lord, I pray that we'll allow Christ to live in us and through us. We'll look forward to that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of Christ coming back for us. Lord, maybe today he'll return. And we'll go home to be with you. Lord, if not, keep us faithful. Keep us walking with you until we hear the trumpet sound. We love you, Lord. I pray that you'll bless each one as we go our separate ways now this afternoon. Lord, I pray you'll give us a good afternoon. Keep our thoughts focused on you. Bring us back this evening for our evening service. We ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Let's sing that together. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, jointed with Jesus as we travel the sun. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you tonight, choir. Choir practice will be at 5.30 tonight, all right?